One of the things that you have been working on uh, throughout the years is kind of showing how, in terms of sexual selection in humans, when we're talking about male traits, you've shown that a lot of masculine traits are not so much driven by female choice and what you know women think is attractive, but actually by male competition, right? So can you explain these ideas and what you found and you know where the literature was at when you were thinking about these ideas? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I study a process called sexual selection, which is the kind of natural selection that favors traits that win mating opportunities. So you could think of you know peacock's tail feathers or uh, antlers on a male deer. Why do they have those weird, costly tra traits? You know, the reason is because over the evolutionary history of that species, those traits helped males win mating opportunities, even if it was costly to their survival. And there are um, sort of multiple modes of sexual selection. In other words, ways of competing for mates, ways that you can win mates. And one of them is contest competition, it's called sometimes, which is the use of force or threat of force against your same sex competitors to win mating opportunities. And so that favors traits like large body size, aggression, weapons like antlers or long canine teeth in many primates, threat displays. And then another mode is mate choice, which is just what it sounds like. And it favors um, sexual displays and ornaments for attracting mates. And um, when I started, I suppose I was, yeah, I started studying um, people as a graduate student. And I, and I thought about the voice as um, when I when I was sort of planning out my dissertation, I, I thought, okay, I wanted to have one of at least two components. I wanted to do some real good in the world, like have some medical relevance or something like that, and or be a new research area that hadn't really been done yet, you know. And I started thinking about the voice. Actually, kind of interesting story. I happened to be doing some holiday shopping in a mall in Pittsburgh, and I heard a couple of guys behind me talking and they were talking like this. And I was like, what's going on there? And then I, I turned around and looked and saw there was also an attractive female nearby. I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's it. Um, and, and so I, I thought, you know, when I was later thinking about my dissertation, I thought, you know, the voice in humans has to be a sexually selected trait. I mean, it's so sexually differentiated, you know, males have a, a voice pitch that's like an octave lower and that happens at puberty. The same thing in, in, you know, uh, uh, peacocks and, and, and deer, like males develop their sexually selected traits, their weapons, their ornaments, whatever, at puberty, when they can actually start paying off in terms of winning mating opportunities and they you know, not don't pay the cost earlier. And so I thought, you know, voice got to be something like that. Um, and when I started studying that trait in particular, but, you know, sort of human sexual selection in general, the literature that I was reading really seemed to suggest that um, the mode of sexual selection that was the most important in shaping the traits of human males was female mate choice. So that's what male traits were. They had beards because that was attractive to our female ancestors. If somebody had really, there wasn't much research on it, but if somebody had written something on voice, it would have been like, well, that's because it attracts females and so on. Facial masculinity because it's attractive to females. And when I started studying the voice and I, I manipulated voice pitch to look at how that affects sort of success in male male dominance competition you know how how scary does it make a guy or how how good of a fighter does it make him sound to other males and i also used the same manipulations i said how how does that affect attractiveness to females you know does it, a lower pitch make them more attractive or less attractive i found that you know lower pitch females preferred that um and that a lower pitch made guys seem bigger and scarier to other guys but the effect on perceptions of fighting ability and dominance and so on uh, were, was about 15 times the size of the effect uh, on attractiveness to females. And I thought, this does not look like a trait that was designed primarily by female mate choice. If you had to ask, like, you know, form follows function, right? Like, you could say, well, right. this trait looks like it was designed by ancestral selection pressures to perform function A, B, or C. It really looked like male voices were designed much better to make guys seem big and scary than it did to attract females. And so then I started thinking about the rest of the literature on faces and bodies and so on. And I thought, you know, when you look at it, if a study even compared, if they say manipulated the, the trait and looked at what's the effect on, you know, appear, appearance of formidability or what's the effect on attractiveness to females, if they looked what 
was always the case was there was a bigger effect on um, dominance, appearance of dominance than attractiveness. And so that that sort of got me thinking about this. And I, I you know, started even sort of going back to first principles and saying, um, well, what would you predict, you know, based on things like uh, our closest living relatives and the way that they compete for mates? And what would you predict based on other characteristics of humans? Um, yeah, and that, that sort of made me see things in a different way than than I had sort of learned from the, what I was reading and learning in classes and that sort of thing. Um, that, you know, really seems like, you know, contest competition was a more important, both were important probably, uh, but but a more important selection pressure on the traits of human males than, than female mate choice. I would love to zoom in on that. In terms of the differences you saw between humans and similarities, you know, to other species that also, you know, male competition drives sexual selection there versus, you know, the peacock. What are the differences between these species? Yeah. Um, so uh, in 2010, I, I published a, a big review paper that I had actually been working on for for years. I, I just had a like a Word file on my desktop mm-hmm. where every time I sort of saw a new relevant study or had a new thought, I put it into this outline. And finally, I got around to writing this thing. And um, and that was one of the things that I thought about was, okay, well, um, if I'm trying to understand what kind of selection pressures were more important, sexual selection pressures were more important in human males, let's go back to the literature on, like, what does the theory say? You know, because there there's a, a body of, of evolutionary theory that says, well, in species like this, you'll see these kinds of traits and these kind. And I looked back at the literature and there was basically nothing um, on, on that, on like, how do you predict across species whether um, the form of sexual selection will be more female choice or a male contest competition or some other, there are other mechanisms of sexual selection as well. Um, like scramble competition. Sometimes the male who's more successful is the one who's just um, more mobile or better at locating mates, you know, that sort of thing. But anyway, so I went back to the literature and there really was no theory. And so then I just started um, sort of using, instead of deduction from a theory, induction, like what do I know about the variety of forms that, you know, occur in nature and what are some common themes? And one of the things that I noticed is that you tend to see more um, sort of sexual ornaments and displays in species that compete for mates in a more unconstrained environment. Um, and you tend to see more contest competition, large males, aggressive males, weapons like antlers and that sort of thing. Um, in species where males compete for mates in a more constrained, like a 2D environment, like they're on the ground or they're on the floor of a body of water. Like if you think of, say, um, you know, crayfish, males rip each other's mm-hmm. arms off, you know? Um, they're, it's an aquatic species. They live in a 3D environment like we all do, but they're spending their time on the, on the you know, floor of a body of water. And I thought, you know, that makes sense because it's easier for males to exclude their competitors from mates in a more constrained environment, like a 2D environment versus birds. Um, it's just too hard, you know, to get, keep other males out of there. Um, and, and furthermore, you know, uh, a female, if she's uninterested, she can just fly away. Um, so really would select for males who can attract mates and in that, you know, you tend to see sexual ornaments in species like birds and sexual displays where males are competing for mates in a more 3D environment. And you tend to see more contest competition where males would compete, um, in a 2D environment. And, um, so I, I published that idea and, you know, while the paper was sort of in review or something, I realized that there was some close other people had some similar ideas, you know, like um, one guy suggested that it could be burrows and tunnels as well. And anyway, um, I haven't right, done like a the nice... one dimensional. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, I talked about that in my paper a bit, too. And I, once I realized that, you know, that there was a little bit of other work on it, I, of course, I cited it. Um, but there, I, you know, so my overall take and that of, you know, at least a few other evolutionary biologists is that this is an important factor. Um, but nobody, to my knowledge, has done a careful cross-species analysis where you're controlling for evolutionary relationships among species and that sort of thing. I, I mean, we've started, and so far the results are re- very strongly encouraging. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's one thing. And then another another factor is just like phylogeny, like who are your relatives? 
because right. you know closely related species tend to share similar traits. And if you look at all of our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, orang- orangutans, gorillas, I mean, they all have the same thing. They sort of compete for mates in somewhat different ways, but males fight each other for mates in all of those species. And um, so you figure, you know, our common ancestor with all of them more than 10 million years ago, you know, I don't know if you go back to orangutans, I don't remember exactly how, how what the current estimate is, but let's say, you know, 15 or so million years ago, um, you know, that, that ancestor would have had males who were bigger and more aggressive and fought each other for mates. And, um, and uh, so anyway. That, yeah, yeah, that no, that's, <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And I think that, you know, it's, it definitely sheds light on the different traits that we see in men and women and the different ways that we choose each other. Because I think that, you know, one of the things that you do see in all of these kinds of sexual preferences um, studies is that women are very much, um, you know, cognizant of a man's status, right? They'll give you the same photo of a man and they'll give different job titles and ask women to rate attractiveness. And then you see that status really uh, carries a lot more weight than anything else. So I think this idea that men, you know, compete with each other, they organize in hierarchies, which we know is a very, uh, you know, masculine trait. Uh, And then women select uh, the men who are the most dominant. And, you know, today we have uh, proxies for dominance, right? But it used to be very physical features like the voice, like, uh, you know, upper body strength uh, and so on. So it's interesting to see how these things kind of evolve uh, into different realms as well in our modern society. Yeah. And um, I mean, for sure, you know, female mate preferences in, in modern humans um, target some of those traits related to um, social status, sometimes physical dominance. It probably changes with age. Um, but there are, are some changes that occurred in our lineage, you know, well after our common ancestor with chimps that I think um, increased the importance of female mate choice and um, may have if not decrease the influence of male contest competition, at least changed its form a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. And so one of those was, and, you know, this is going way back, um, but with the evolution of our own genus Homo, right? Because, you know, the first hominins, like say 7 million years ago or somewhere around there, um, you know, were different genre, right? And it wasn't our own genus Homo didn't. So those were bipedal apes that had, you know, Big brains for a primate, but small compared to us. Um, But they walked on two legs and had already had changes in hand shape and reduction in canine size and that sort of thing. But our own genus didn't evolve, you know, for several million years until, you know, somewhere maybe around two and a half million years. And somewhere maybe two million to a million and a half years ago, Homo erectus um, appeared. And there are some changes there that suggest changes in our form of mating competition as well. And one of them was, it looks like we started eating a lot more meat and that, um, and we started becoming very good hunters. And there are changes in the, sh- in the shape of the shoulder, for example, for example, that suggest that we got good at targeting prey with spears. And right, the throwing. Sure, yeah, throwing, we're very good throwers. And, um, and we probably sacrificed some strength for speed and accuracy. At, at throwing. Um, and, um, you know, of course, a spear is not going to preserve very well. The oldest s- potential throwing spears that we have are between 300 and 400,000 years ago, found in a cave in Germany. It's incredible that a wooden spear, it's actually a bunch of them, survive that long. It's, it's amazing. Incredible. And then there are some projectile points um, from more like a half a million years old that might have been for a thrusting spear rather than a throwing spear. And then for, from about 279,000 years ago, um, there are some what look like javelin tips. Um, anyway, but the, all of this probably actually happened more like that is, you know, using being good at throwing projectiles like fire hardened spears um, more like a million and a half years ago. And there was probably some big changes in the way that we uh, sort of our mating system, if you will, that happened around that time. Um, 
And I'll, I'll start with this idea. If we had um, a chimp-like or a gorilla-like mating structure where the dominant male gets the mating opportunities, he just uses force to exclude the other males. In gorillas, right. the way that works is that it's just a single male, sometimes another male like his son who doesn't get much mating. But usually there's one adult male in the group. Maybe half the time there's just one adult male in the group. It depends on. Um, there aren't any other adult males because that male won't tolerate other males in the group. So there's a fight and whatever male wins, he's the one that has access to the five or six or seven adult females in the group and all the offspring are his. Um, so that's one way. And another way is to have a multi-male, multi-female structure like you have in chimpanzees, where it's just that the alpha male who beats the heck out of all the other males until they you know, don't challenge him. Um, he mates with females when they're fertile. And the right, females and signal that. And it's, when they're an estrus, that's right. Yeah. And, and they signal that with really pronounced genital swellings that you could see from the moon. I mean, it's, you know, like <laughs> amazing that they're walking around with these things. Um, it, but that's a trait that they evolved, right? To say, I'm fertile now, now's the time. Um, and what, what does that do? It enables the males to see who's fertile and for then the alpha male to get the mating opportunities because the other he fight, fights off the other males. And that's been shown that like the alpha male really monopolizes copulations around the around estrus, around the fertile part of the cycle. Well, that's fine for females because if there's nothing else that you're getting from a male than DNA, then sure, mate with the dominant male and your offspring have better quality genes and they're healthier. And, and if they're males, they're more likely to grow up to be dominant males and so on. Right, right. However, if males can offer something else, then females might go for that. And so, you know, a million and a half years ago, when males started to become really good at hunting, then that is something that could have changed the game because then subordinate males could say, well, look, I may not be the alpha male, but I will provide resources um, and protection. And females might say, okay, that's actually a better deal. I will have more offspring that way than by going with the, with the alpha male. Um, but they would have to be in on that. The females would have to be in one way it would be suppress cues to ovulation. Right. Right. So, right. I wanted to yeah, talk about that. So the dominant that. male can't just bully his way in and fertilize the female anyway. Um, and then what's the, the investing male, why would he invest now? That's not his offspring. Right. Um, and so, you know, that might've been that the, I, I my, that's my guess. We don't have a time machine. So, you know, how, do, how do we know? We have evidence that people really started, our ancestors, you know, Homo erectus, really started eating a lot of meat and they, and they were, became good hunters and they um, probably you know, used projectiles. Um, but we also know that we lost obvious cues to estrus, right? You know, um, I mean, you know, my lab and other labs have done research showing that, that in women, their attractiveness changes across the ovulatory cycle. But these are very subtle cues compared to what you see in chimps. And so... Um, you know, that might have played a big role, but that also could then give more scope to female mate choice. Uh, because right. it's it's more difficult for males to monopolize fertile females. And so females might sort of be exercising more choice and say, I'm going to go with this investing male rather than the dominant male, because nobody can actually tell when I'm fertile. And so it's harder to monopolize me. You know, so that's that's one thing. And another thing is that, um, you know, there's some limitations on males bullying each other and humans. And one of them is um, there are several possibilities, but one of them is just the fact that there's also coalitional aggression in humans. That males exactly. team up. I wanted to ask you yeah. about that. There's yeah. a tension here between, you know, male male competition, but then again, you want to group together and go hunt together and fight other groups of males. Groups. So how does that yeah. work? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you know, unfortunately, that's probably been in our, our lineage for quite a long time. Male chimpanzees do something very similar. They, they, you know, their group, they're fighting within their group and much more, um, more frequently than, than human males do. Like a hundred times more often they fight each other. It's really common than, than human males. The lethality is the same. In other words, like in, say, a, a modern hunter-gatherer, and a, a wild chimpanzee population, males are kill each other about as often, which means that human males are about a hundred times as lethal when they when they fight, which makes sense because we have by far the 
best weapons, right? I mean, we don't have, we've lost our canine teeth, but we evolved. Yeah. Something we compensated. That you could kill. Yeah. But more than, more than that, right. By producing weapons that, uh, I mean, a, a, a male forager with a spear, one male could kill, uh, an African lion that's three times his size with much greater speed, strength, and canines and so on. Uh, a polar bear, eight times his size, an African elephant, 70 times the size of a male with tusks and, you know, also faster and so on. Incredible. Our, so, yeah. So we, we lost canines, but, um, but, you know, there's probably, this shift towards, you know, the cognitive ability and the accuracy, yeah, as you said. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, you know, I, I, there's plenty of debate among anthropologists, but my guess is that that played a large role in our losing our canine teeth was that we're not biters anymore. We ha- we developed weapons that are more effective and you can, you can attack an enemy at it without putting your most vulnerable body part in close proximity. Right. Um, we traded it for thumbs. Yeah. That, yeah. That's right. And actually you <laughs> see that interestingly enough, you see that in the earliest hominins that, you know, um, there are like a billion different hypotheses for why bipedalism evolved. Why do we go from being, uh, you know, something knuckle or fist walkers and spending a lot of time in trees to walking on land. And, and I can't possibly cover all the hypotheses. But one that Darwin suggested, which seemed kind of obvious to him at the time, was, well, you know, uh, we're pretty good with tools. So probably that, right? And, and it's it's mind boggling to me how anthropologists have, um, have I don't know. They haven't loved that idea, and they've come up with with lots of other hi- hypotheses. Oh, why? I mean, what, do, do tell me why what is, is that controversy? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, one one reason is because um, there there were a few, and I, I haven't really. Some it's of okay my, if you just have the highlights. Okay. Yeah, and some of my knowledge is a little bit dated, but but my when I was learning this stuff years ago, one counter argument was yeah, but they had we didn't get big brains until later. Um, you know, they, they were small brained okay. and, and bipedal. Okay. But chimps are amazing <laughs> tool users. They make and use right, tools. Right. They make a tool and carry it around to use it later. And we're, you know, that's our thing is tool using. So there, you can't tell me that our common ancestor with chimps didn't use tools. And so that's one thing. Okay. Small brains. Another one was, well, you don't see um, tools until, you know, millions of years later. Hold on. You mean stone tools. And not only just stone tools, manufactured stone tools that has changed enough that you can tell that it was manipulated by a, a hominin. Okay, but number one, those weren't the first tools ever made. And number two, the first tools that were used, you might not recognize. It could just be a rock that you used for bashing things or a, or a bone or a, a you know piece of wood that right, doesn't right. preserve, whatever. But anyway, one of the things I was going to say, you mentioned the thumbs, is that that's one of the first changes you see in hominins is that they get shorter fingers and longer thumbs. Now, why are those happening together unless it's because this is good for gripping, right? And then you also see a reduction in canine size. And there, as far as we know, in the earliest hominins, there was huge sexual size dimorphism. Males were much bigger than females. So males, you don't have that. You know, I don't know if you know this, but in most species, females are bigger than males. Most of the species really, we're familiar that. with. Yeah, by far. Um, because there's always selection on females for fecundity, to produce more eggs, bigger eggs, and so on, right? And so you really only see large male. In some species, it's incredible. There's a, what's the record? It's a, I think it's a deep sea, um, like an angler fish. Females are 500,000 times the size of a male. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> he and has the biggest, one job and one job only. <laughs> that's right. He's, he's swimming testes, right? And if he yeah, ever yeah. finds a female, he attaches for life. That's it. You know, he's wow. like, if he's lucky enough to find a female, he just becomes a pair of gonads attached to the female. <laughs> um, and and the, the record for the other way around, the biggest male relative to female is another fish. And males are only like 12 or 13 times the size. And the record for mammals is the, is uh, southern elephant seals, where um, males are uh, as much as 10 times the size of a female, which is, a, a you know, big sex difference, but nothing like yeah. half a million, right? Um, but anyway, females are usually bigger and males evolve to be larger uh, almost always. The reason why is because they fight each other. That, you know, that that's stronger than than selection on females to be big. Males evolve to be bigger to fight each other for mates. Um, and so anyway, we know that the, in the earliest hominins, it looks like there was, you know, strong sexual selection on males because they were bigger. And yet 
they lost the primary weapon of primates, which is long canine teeth. That doesn't really make sense unless they had some other weapon, you know, and they're bipedal and their hands have changed. So, I mean, to me, the earliest hominins males were using something, rocks to bash each other, or it's just easy to see how um, in a primate that already made and used tools, our common ancestor with chimps and, you know, with chimps, that the tool use became a major adaptation that, that caused a bunch of other changes. Right, right. So, you know, the fact that we have these weapons that have evolved and the lethality, you know, of a fight goes up, did that also change the fact that, you know, it's not as easy to just compete with one another because it means you're, you know, you're fighting to the death. So did that also have a little shift in terms of we might want to get along and fight the other guys, right? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, I was I was going there and I just got sidetracked because of their no all worries, these other no fun worries. things to talk about. <laughs> but yeah, so so there are two two factors that I wanted to mention. One of them is the coalitional aggression, which we share with chimps, which is um you can't be too uh you know aggressive with your fellow group members because you also need them in competition with other groups. And that's something that we see across human societies. And, um, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to tell whether you've got group level aggression. If you go back too far in the archeological or paleontological record, I mean, how do you, how does it preserve? Right. Um, but the fact that chimps also do this, that they, that a group of male chimps will like patrol a territory, sometimes invade another group's territory if they see a, a lone male out from another group, they'll viciously attack that male and that sort of thing. Um, the fact that you see that in chimps and you see that in, in humans and humans cross-culturally suggests that it's been with us for a very long time. So that's one thing that could limit within group aggression is the more important your group is against other groups, the the more cohesion you've got within your group and the less you can sort of tolerate, um, you know, despotic males who try to, you know, uh, aggress against their their group members but another factor that um a, a, an evolutionary biologist at harvard richard Wrangham has suggested uh oh no he this, maybe i'm suggesting this never mind um okay, he, okay. That out. he's talking he, he mentioned that um language played a role but but i yeah my <laughs> i, I <should> give myself <laughs> credit um working on a paper on this right now but weapons yeah um that uh you know you can't I mean, I, I feel bad about saying this because it almost suggests that there's something um, peaceful about weapons. Um, but Hey, you know, I, yeah. in high school, I think I was at like 10th grade and it was like AP history or something. And I wrote this paper about how the atom bomb uh, made it so there were less wars in the world. You know, <laughs> it was yeah. a bullshit, yeah. bullshit high school paper, but yeah. it goes oh, wait, off the that? same. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, I thought, OK, let's uh, let's play with this. It, we have this like very constrained kind of assignment. I was like, OK, uh, but this idea that the fact that the lethality of yeah. combat goes up and the price is so much higher. So mm -hmm. you're not going to engage, yeah. you know, in these kinds of wars and the wars that we see today are very different, you know, from uh, uh, wars on resources that uh, yeah. we're used to. Um, yeah, but right. I mean, it, if your if your competitor can easily kill you, then you, you need to be a lot more polite. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> and also, I wonder how much that's played a role in our sort of developing alternative means of competition that are non-lethal that have rules you know, sports, basically, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, I mean, that's something that, um, in that 2010 paper, I actually had a section on it initially. And I, I took it out. It seemed like, yeah. And, you know, sort of male fascination with sports, especially violent sports, like, you know, boxing and wrestling and MMA and stuff like that. Um, you know, I wonder how much that has to do with the roots and sort of male, male, you know, contest competition. And I do took it out because my paper yeah, is too yeah. long anyway. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, do you know Joyce Benenson? And yeah. her, you know, book yeah, yeah. Warriors on Warriors. So she has this whole idea of how, you know, from the age of preschool, uh, boys are already kind of fascinated with the enemy. You know, they have this yeah. idea of there's an enemy. So I think in a world where you don't have a clear enemy, you know, you have another sports team 
that and, and right. that kind of drive just is projected onto sports because men need that outlet. You know, it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> that, yeah, that's right. I, I, and I can remember doing that when I was a kid, even when I was playing uh, on my own, uh, like out, out in the woods or something, you know, constructing a fort. It was um, against some imagined enemy that was going to be attacked yeah, yeah, yeah. at some point. You know? <laughs> um, but um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, and also, I think that's why, um, you know, alien attacking movies and zombie movies and that sort oh, of thing sure. are, are great because it's like, you know, gets at that feeling of like, um, you know, w- winning a battle or, or fighting a battle against the enemy, but it's more guilt free because it's not your fellow human beings. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. Like it's out there. Mindless, yeah, or something. Yeah, evil. Yeah. And I evil. think you know the conflicts today are so internal and embedded that it's hard to to you know to have a clear you know evil. So it's uh, it's easier if we can project it outwards. Uh, but okay, I want to pick your brain on hormones and how testosterone and estrogen uh, play in masculinization and feminization. So there's, you know, a few ideas going around in terms of, you know, we know testosterone is the masculine uh, hormone, but there is a misconception that estrogen is what masculinizes the brain during development. So why does this misconception exist to begin with? And, and why, why is it wrong? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so like, I'll, let me step back just a minute and, and sort of to, to provide a segue to what we were just talking about. Imagine this problem that selection has to solve when the optimal trait for males and females is different. You can imagine whatever pelvic width and humans, you know, they're like, you have to have a wider pelvis to get a baby out that's not might not be ideal for locomotion or whatever or body fat or or change behavioral differences or whatever how does selection produce antlers or whatever um when males and females have pretty much the same dna right because it, and you know the way that species sexually differentiate that varies across taxa across across groups of of organisms but um in vertebrates anyway in mammals in particular Males and females have almost the same DNA. Males have a Y chromosome that has a few genes on it, and females have two Xs. But other than that, they have the same 22 pairs of autosomes. And so how does selection, you know, produce different traits in males and females when they have the same DNA? And the answer is is sex differences in patterns of gene expression. You have the same genes, but when are they turned on or turned off? At what rate are they producing their proteins? And the way that that's regulated is with sex hormones. So early in development, if you develop testes, then testes produce high levels of androgens like testosterone. And the the androgen travels all over the body. That's the nice thing about a hormone. That's its function. This is a chemical messenger that can, it's a broadcast signal to the whole body because it travels in the bloodstream everywhere. And anywhere in the body that has receptors for that hormone, then the hormone can bind to the receptor The receptor goes into the cell, into the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is. It binds to the DNA and it regulates gene expression. And so that means that your whole body has information on sort of what sex you are. Are you producing high levels of androgens or not? Um, Because that information is going everywhere in the body. And then anywhere that there's a tissue that has receptors, whether it's the vocal folds or the muscles or the brain, then that changes patterns of gene expression. Um, in a more male typical pattern versus a female typical pattern. Okay, so that's how um, selection solves this problem of what's called um, well sexually antagonistic selection, or I don't know. I, I should probably. Who cares about the terms? There's the no, no. The but terms, I'm I'm with you. Like turning yeah. things on and turning things off, even right. though we have the same blueprint. Yes, and and you know basically what it does is it says okay, imagine that the sexes have the same distribution of a trait. But really, females would have higher reproductive success over here, and males would have higher reproductive success over here. How does selection pull them apart? It does it by making genes um, responsive to sex hormones, right? And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just to give, it, and by the way, it's not always completely resolved. This this sexual conflict is not always completely resolved. Oftentimes, females have a little bit more male typical trait than is optimal for them. And males have a little bit more female typical. And that's the case for height, for example. 
that the average female is a little bit taller than is ideal for reproductive success. And the average male is a little bit shorter because they have the same gene, DNA. They have the same genes. And Interesting. they're only partly, you know, um, any selection on males to be taller is pulling females a little bit in the wrong direction. And any selection on females to be shorter is pulling males a little bit. And the sexes aren't completely pulled apart by sex differences and, and gene expression driven by hormones. But okay, that's how it works. Um, and um, so then you could say, well, what sex hormones? Because it could be, you know, ovaries produce high levels of estrogens, um, testes produce high levels of androgens. The answer is that mostly it's complicated. I mean, that's always the answer in biology, right? And, and anywhere in, in nature, things are complicated. Um, but most of the story is is androgen exposure, is testosterone exposure. And um, it's just that, so testosterone produced by the testes of males goes throughout the body and it masculinizes the body, including the brain. And the reason mm -hmm. why you mentioned, but what about estrogen? The reason why there is some confusion about a role of estrogen is because a lot of what we know about these processes is from lab rodents, mice and rats, mostly rats, I think, but it depends if it's gene expression, things more mice than rats, but th that's what we know. And the way it works in rodents is a little bit different from the way it works in, in primates. In primates, testosterone goes into the brain, it binds to androgen receptor, that binds to DNA and it affects gene expression. In rodents, testosterone goes into the brain, it's converted by an enzyme into estrogen. And it binds estrogen. Right, receptor. aromatase, right? Yes. Like, everyone's been hearing about it because THC yeah. increases aromatase. So, yeah. you know, yeah. and don't that happens too in us weed. too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Um, but it, so that's an interesting thing. And it just, that's not what happens almost certain. We don't know for anything for certain, right? But the evidence is pretty strong that that's not what happens in humans and other anthropoid primates. And I can talk a little bit about some of that um, evidence, if you will, but uh, if, if you'd like. But one interesting question is why then are females in mice and rats, why aren't, why aren't their brains masculinized by their high estrogen levels? Right? How and is the, that? And, yeah. And the reason is because the, the estrogen can't get into the brain. It's bound in the blood by a protein that's produced fetally called alpha fetoprotein. It by, that binds the estrogen and it prevents it from crossing the blood brain barrier to get it into the brain. So testosterone can get into the brain. There it can be converted to estrogen and masculinize the brain. But estrogen produced by females can't get in. So, so alpha fetoprotein is sort of protecting their brains from being masculinized, the brains of females. However, in humans, alpha fetoprotein doesn't bind estrogen very well. Estrogen could get into the brain. It actually binds androgens a lot better. And so it probably protects female brain, developing brains from the testosterone produced by their ovaries and adrenal glands and whatever else. So. Yes. Interesting. You know, your explanation really shed light on this idea of how, you know, I like to look at sex differences and understand them as there are feminine characteristics and masculine characteristics. So it's not, you know, male, female, black mm -hmm. and white, but yep. the fact that we do have this mix, there are female typical patterns, there are male typical patterns. But understanding how these hormones can affect us all and how you can have gender nonconforming behaviors and whatnot, and that these hormones really play a part. And that does not cancel out the existence of sex differences. But understanding how all of these things come into play, I think, is really interesting. And yeah. I would love to understand, you know, in terms of perinatal development, how does that shift? someone's, you know, masculine or feminine traits in terms of cognitive abilities, physical abilities, whether they're male or female, how does that work? Yeah. Um, I, and I'll start by saying that, you know, when I teach about this stuff, um, and I'm going to start tomorrow, um, my, my next, uh, you know, semester, uh, I teach a big 300 student class called sex and evolution. That's all this stuff. And I, I love it. And I think my students, how can do tell they let I you teach about. that these days? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the thing is, um, it's sex is right in the title. So it's not like it's a secret. You know, they're going to like, yeah, we're going right, to be talking right. about these things. Um, and, you know, they signed up for it. But, um, but you know, I get about 
a third of the way through the semester. And I, I have to pause for a minute because I, I've been talking a lot about sexual selection, the evolution of sex differences. You know, I start by talking about like, why does sexual reproduction evolve? Because lots of species are asexual. And then, okay, given sexual, so sexual reproduction, which is two gametes fusing, right? Why have different sized gametes? Because that's what sexes are, right? Is like males produce small gametes, females produce big gametes. That's how you could tell if you just had a species that you never saw before. And, and they have, do they have sexes? Well, do they produce two different gamete sizes? Yes, they do. Okay, then they have sexes. Which, which are the males? Well, it doesn't matter what traits they have, whether one has antlers or whatever. The ones that produce the small gametes, those are the males. That's just by definition. But I talk about how that evolves. And then I talk about sexual selection. And then I get to a point, I start talking about people. And then I stop and I say, I show a picture of that book, um, Women Are From Mars. I mean, Men Are From yes. Mars, Women Are From Venus. That's bestseller. Yeah. And I say, I don't want to give you this impression. <laughs> I'm worried that I've done it. <laughs> and I show the earth. And I say, I'm pretty sure we're from this planet. Um, because one, one of the points that, I, that I'm worried that I make is, is that you know, hu males, human males and females are so different that we might as well be from different planets, you know? And there are lots of sex differences, but we're also the same species that shares almost the same DNA that's experienced very similar selection pressures over our history, you know, eating the same foods, avoiding the same predators, living in the same environments, cooperating together, so on, right? And so, you know, we're the, we're the same species, so I expect males and females to be similar on you know, probably most dimensions, but we are different in some ways. And the cool thing is that you can use evolutionary thinking, like say sexual selection theory to understand how the sexes will differ and, and why, right? Why would those differences ever evolve? Um, and so, yeah, there's some big sex differences in, um, you know, what you call, you know, gender conforming behaviors, right? That, that young males uh, in humans are are similar to lots of male mammals. They're, they engage in more what's called rough and tumble play on on average. You know, species in which males end up competing physically for mates when they're older, they start practicing when they're younger, you know? And I mean, it's a skill. And, and the same thing with like, say mothering, you know, that like, uh, you know, we, despite the massive amount of time and energy and effort, I mean, you and I talked before, the interview started about how I've got three kids and it was all their first day of school today. <laughs> and I know that's where I was. That's why I'm tired. And you know, like that maybe hopefully somewhat. Coherent. No one can tell. Okay. That's good. <laughs> um, if I'm like not thinking of words, that's, uh, you know, that's why, but, but I'm sorry, but my kids are more important than, you know, than my No, dad. no, good, uh, good. Yeah. Uh, a modern, yeah. modern, uh, yeah. modern father. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and like I said, I think that's kind of been a thing for, you know, in our species and maybe all the way back to, I don't know how far, you know, uh, Homo erectus or something like that, that um, males have been pretty paternal. Um, okay, now I did it. I lost where I was going. Um, no worries. I want to, I want to oh, jump I know, in. But, so, oh, but, oh yeah, but, go but, for it. Go for it. Yeah. Well, we just, uh, sorry. Yeah. But anyway, what I was going to say <laughs> is that, um, that, you know, despite the, the high level of, of male investment and in mates and offspring, there is no society in which females don't invest more in their offspring. I mean, number one, males can't gestate. Um, and that's a massive investment of time and effort. Um, uh, and, you know, one time just for my class, I calculated how many extra calories our female ancestors had to get just to get through um, gestation plus a year and a half of, of nursing. Um, and that's, uh, probably a way underestimate because you know forager females tend to breastfeed longer than that but it was um an additional 1800 uh, mcdonald's cheeseburgers are required <laughs> to get to get you just that far and that is, and when wow. you think about our ancestors like with no grocery stores just all the food is what you can get from your environment and to have to bring in that extra amount so it's just a massive amount of investment that females make and there's no society in which on average males spend more time carrying babies, caring for babies and that sort of thing. But that also is a skill, like being good with that. And so that's probably why um, human females and, and chimp females and so on, that they're interested when they're young in babies, because that's going to be a thing. They nurse the dolls and, and, and they yeah, do these like play pretend. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, the, but so those are so-called gender, you know, conforming behaviors. And, you know, there's big sex differences in those things. And you're probably, some, some, you know, you could say, well, how much of that is organized by, it's a brain difference. It has to be. If you have a psychological or behavioral difference, it's in the brain. People think that if there's a difference in the brain, that it's somehow, uh, it, uh, like it's not malleable, right? Um, that like, oh, it's brain, it's biological, it can't be changed. But every difference, every behavioral difference from clothing choice to whatever, if it's if there's a psychological or behavioral difference, it's some some something in the brain. Um, and it could be that it's because boys and girls are raised differently. Right. That it could be that, well, boys are, you know, rough and tumble play is more encouraged in boys and and playing with dolls is more encouraged in girls. And that probably plays a role. I mean, it really does. I, I don't know how much you could really um, switch things around. And, and the fact that you see similar patterns of behavior in our you know, close living relatives that don't have anything like gender socialization that we do suggest that it's maybe not most of the story, but it could play a role. But but also, you know, early sex hormone exposure probably organizes the brain to be more interested in doing some things and not other things. And there's plenty of evidence for that. In right. Too. Yeah. I think I think, you know, this idea that, first of all, we are more the same than we are different, but that these differences are really, really interesting. And there is a narrative today that really tries to make men and women the same. And I think we miss a lot of really important information there because we do have these different tendencies. We do have, you know, these different inclinations and interests and not all of us. Obviously, there's a lot of variability, but understanding what masculinity is and what femininity is, I think is really important these days because it helps an individual understand themselves better. You know, I might be a female who is more masculine in my traits. And I had a conversation uh, with a friend who got really upset with me about this, but I told her, you know, a woman who's super competitive and very career oriented, that's a more masculine presenting female. And she disagreed and she said, why can't that be her femininity? I told her, you know, testosterone is also at play here. You know, testosterone interacts with dopamine and it makes effort more uh, satisfying. So we do have these masculine and feminine forces. And understanding how the typical patterns are can help us understand where we're at and where we want to be and, you know, how we want to organize our lives, how we want to relate with each other. Uh, but I think that canceling these ideas out completely doesn't really help. And I don't know, what do you think about, you know, gender socialization? Because just in general, I I see kids kind of having their temperament and their interests. And I was very much a tomboy growing up and you could not persuade me to, you know, not play fight. <laughs> I would yeah. I would stop the game much earlier than the other guys because, you know, once, once people started getting hurt, you know, I would... Uh, tap out, but still like video games and things like that. And I was built in. There was no socialization. My sisters couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't care less for these kinds of things. So I don't know. What do you think about gender socialization? Yeah. Um, well, first I'll, I'll say, you know, you can, you can understand why people have this approach, right? Because um, right, if right. you start from the idea that people should be treated, you know, given equal opportunities and, and rights and so on. A hundred percent. It's way easier to do that if you just say yeah, there, there are no differences, you know. Um, I, I don't, I think that if we decide that, you know, people should be given equal opportunities regardless of their sex, gender, and so on, then it doesn't matter whether there are differences between them. They should still be given, you know, equal opportunities. And I also think that knowing that there's a sex difference in something um, do, doesn't mean that you should treat the sexes differently. Like say you're applying for a job and you're like, well, females, I want somebody who's more this or that. And females are more this or more males are more that. So I'm going to assume that they're better um, a candidate because of their, I think that's a bad idea too. And so, you know, but you can see how people would want, had be motivated to sort of downplay um, sex differences and also um, want to believe that any sex differences in behavior or psychology that you see could easily be socialized away, right? That it's just the right. way we treat them and we can get rid of it. 
um, if we treat, and you know, but so what do I think about gender socialization? I think for some things it probably um, plays a very big role. I mean, humans are very smart, we're very social and we're good at learning. And so, you know, you can learn uh, what's socially, I mean, a lot of being a kid is learning, like we start out as little monsters. You know, the most violent <laughs> people are toddlers, right? They are ridiculously right, violent. Right, right. Thankfully, they're not very good at it, you know? <laughs> and I mean, they're like, you know, uh, clumsy and so on. Um, and they're super cute. Um, but, you know, then you have to teach them, like, it's not okay to hit. And, and you can't take that. And, you know, we just went to a, an amusement park and I've got the, the little one. And it's like, nope, get in line. You know, can't just go right to the front because you would rather get right, you know, be the first one on the water slide. Um, and so we have to learn. And that's, a, you know, a big part of socialization is sort of learning the right way to act. And some of that is like, what's the right way to act according to your sex or gender or something like that, right? Um, so I don't know how important it is, but I think it's pretty important. But some sex differences in, in psychology and behavior, I think you, we can't do much to to affect them socially. Sexual orientation is one of those things that um, I think that if if you have if you had a male typical um, androgen uh, action during development, you had sort of in the male range of testosterone, and you have typical sensitivity because there's also variation in how sensitive based on, you know, the receptors, how sensitive um, individuals are to hormones. But if you had male typical um, exposure, you're highly likely to be attracted to females. Um, and, and that there's not much that can be done about that. And there are a few cases where, um, seven cases actually in the medical record where um, a male had a typical male prenatal development, but then they were later reassigned to female in infancy because two two cases were uh, a circumcision accident where the penis was accidentally destroyed and three of the cases were an abdominal malformation called cloacal extrophy again the penis was malformed and way back in you know the dark ages the you know the medical community said well look uh, we can't make a good well functioning penis but we can do a pretty good job with a vagina so how about you have a daughter you know and and, you know, really the way, whether a kid becomes a well-adjusted girl or boy just depends on how you raise them. So, you know, we'll just re-raise this as a daughter and everything will go swimmingly. Um, and we now know that that's, that's not what happened. And um, in six of those seven cases, gender identity was male despite being raised as a female. And in all seven cases, um, attraction was to females. And the statistical odds of seven f females with female typical development all being um, attracted to females in, in adulthood is less than one in 50 trillion. So it's very unlikely that that would happen, <laughs> um, you know, by chance. Wow. It, it would almost certainly prenatal events, probably testosterone affecting patterns of gene you expression know, in the brain. Yeah. I heard about one of these cases and at the age of around three or four, uh, this boy who was raised as a girl, he wanted to pee standing up. You know, he like there were things that were so embedded within him that how how else does that come up? You know, and uh, I think a lot of these instincts and these interests uh, and these behaviors, uh, they're they're very much you know sexually determined, and canceling them out or trying to create an even playing field where there aren't any differences at all. At the end of the day, I don't, I don't know how helpful it is. While, you know, we want equality for everybody, we're not necessarily the same. And I think we have one of the most uh, equal opportunity societies where you can be a woman who's more masculine and a man who's more feminine and you can live your life, you know, and people accept that. And I think it's just understanding what these different things represent and what our tendencies are. I think it can help us a lot, especially, you know, and just in terms of like relationship psychology and things like that. A lot of the language is very gender neutral. And yet the typical fights that people get into are kind of, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Every now and again, you slip into the same patterns. So I do think that understanding, you know, the evolutionary basis for these things could be very helpful just in terms of understanding where our, um, where we're starting from, you know what I mean? 
Yeah. Uh, I think that that could definitely be helpful. In terms of, you know, your research in this world of sex differences, where there are a lot of people who are uh, trying to kind of debunk these ideas, what disagreements have you faced? You know, what kind of... Uh, kind of backlash have you gotten? What kind of, you know, arguments have you seen that are trying to show that sex differences don't even exist in the brain and elsewhere? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I always kind of wonder about this, like in my career, both in my research career and in my teaching, um, you know, like why I haven't gotten fired yet. And, um, <laughs> and I, I think it's because people can Maybe I just kind of keep my head down, but I think even when I speak about this stuff, people get a sense that, um, you know, I'm well-intentioned and, and that um, I, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, and I'm just trying to understand, you know, human variation. Um, but, I, you know, I've encountered some um, debate in the scientific literature, but it's all been entirely civil. Um, and just like a matter of, you know, a disagreement about what the evidence suggests and what's the best evidence and how to analyze data and that sort of thing. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned that, you know, sort of acknowledging sex differences and also acknowledging that there's tons of variation within sexes, right? And that, you know, there are plenty of people who um, are, you know, sort of, let's say anatomically um, and whatever, uh, chromosomally um, one sex, but have not only have sort of psychological characteristics more typical of the other, but identify as, you know, say a male who identifies as female and so on. And, you know, I mean, this is not the domain of science at all, but, you know, from a personal perspective, I don't see why that's a problem for anybody, you know, like um, people should be free to, you know, identify and, and, you know, feel how they are. Um, but another, another point is sometimes when there's a sex difference, um, we lack uh, precision about describing the magnitude of that difference. Um, so, for right. example, there's a sex difference in sexual orientation um, that, you know, males tend to be attracted to females and vice versa. That is a very large sex difference. Um, there's very <laughs> little overlap. There is overlap, of course, but there's very little. But you could say there's a sex difference in sexual orientation, and there's also a sex difference in mental rotations ability, like this cognitive ability where you imagine what a 3D object looks like rotated in space. Those are completely different in, in magnitude. The sex difference in sexual orientation is maybe six standard deviations, so there's very little overlap. The sex difference in mental rotations is less than one standard deviation. So yes, there's a difference. If you collected data on 100 males and 100 females, and you did a statistical test, you could say, oh yeah, males, you know, perform a little bit better th than females. Um, but there, there's so much overlap that you, talking about those as both being sex differences then misses that point that, you know, for many of these traits that show a sex difference, it's actually quite, quite minimal, you know? Um, and so mm -hmm, I think that's mm -hmm. useful too, to, you know, people who actually study this stuff don't just say, hey, see, there's a, st a statistical difference. They actually quantify it and say, well, by how many standard deviations do the sexes differ or something. But that's something that I think gets missed a lot in the popular, you know, press and discussion of these things too. Um, right. Things are very much black and white when you. Yeah, that's right. But males are this way, females. And it gets to, to, you know, matter from Mars thing. And, and part of the reason is because you don't expect your average reader to know what the heck, you know, a standard deviation is or what Cohen's D is, or, <laughs> you know, like they don't have st stats background to be able to say, you know, how big, um, is this difference really? Um, anyway, so that's something that I could stand with, you know, some more clarity and precision and discussion, you know, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think this is definitely important because the variability between people, I'm really interested in understanding the concept. You know, we talk about gender stereotypes, but I think that's a unsophisticated unsophisticated way of talking about gender archetypes, you know, like the femininity and masculinity and what they represent. And, you know, this has a lot of evolutionary background. So understanding why our heuristics, you know, of what feminine and masculine is, that's something that is evolved and it does have biological basis. And then, you know, present day, there's a ton of variability, but being able to use these terms more freely 
and not being black and white uh, on either end. You know, there aren't any differences or we need to go back to the 1950s. I don't think uh, anyone's looking for that. Uh, but, well, I guess maybe some. But I think that just understanding, you know, these ideas and these differences and these nuances and being able to talk about them is a lot more helpful than camping in either one of these sides. Uh, so I do, I do love this research that you're doing and really just showing, you know, the historical evolutionary processes that make us who we are. So I think it's important work. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I like it a lot too. <laughs> I honestly, I mean, what got me into it was um, just sort of nerdy curiosity. Um, yeah, where did the, it come from? Where what? Yeah. Where's the evolution obsession coming from <laughs> for David? Well, that, when I was an undergrad, I I, I took I, I went to this little college in Ohio called Kenyon College, um, and I was interested in studying poetry writing, and Kenyon was well known oh, for wow. that. It had, Ken, the Kenyan Review is a well-known literary anthology, and so I went to to, to do that, and um, and it took a year. You had to take a year of first of freshman English. We called it first year English, um, uh, and then submit a writing sample and so on. Anyway, in the in the meantime, I had taken some other classes. I knew I wanted to take anthropology. I always thought that was cool stuff, and I took philosophy, and I really liked that too. And I just kind of liked thinking about like big questions, you know, the big questions about humanity. Why are we the way we are? How do we get that way? Uh, you know, and I just felt like anthropology took a more sort of empirical, scientific approach. At least at the time, philosophy felt more like it was relying on sort of introspection, like just think about it and you'll get the answer. But you need to take your good ideas and then and then test them with data in nature and then go back and say, well, that was not such a good idea. And let's change the thing <laughs> and test that idea and so on. I just felt like I was getting more of that in anthropology. And I was really interested in human evolution. Just cool, you know, thinking about these fossils from millions of years ago and so on, like where we came from that way. And I was especially interested in psychology and behavior. And at the time, um, you know, evolutionary psychology, like you could study the evolution of human psychology and behavior in lots of different fields. And I would say evolutionary psychology is um, doing a, you know, nice job of that. Um, but some of that was in, in anthropology, especially at the time. And um so that was it. I was interested in human evolution and and maybe especially in how our behavior evolved and why we have those behavioral patterns that we do and that sort of thing. Probably no special interest in sex other than what a, any normal person is interested in sex. You know? um, and, <laughs> any uh, normal undergrad. Yeah, any normal undergrad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I got to grad school and um, I mean, I was not the most re most responsible undergrad. Um, and uh, didn't really do a whole ton of research, but it made sense when I, I got into my advisor's office. And this, I mean, this is ridiculous, but he was a biological anthropologist. And I was like, biological anthropology, I, I'm interested in behavior. Like that's cultural, right? Um, and um, then we talked for a while and I was like, okay, yeah, now I know why you, you know, chose me as your, your grad student. Cause we were interested, he was interested in behavior and he was studying sex differences. And um, I thought, man, there, if you're just interested in understanding human psychology and behavior, um, you know, it was kind of a matter of like, look where the light is, you know, that like there, there was just so much good research being done there to try to understand variation. Like if there's one variable that explains more variability among humans than any other one in psychology and behavior, it's probably sex, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, it was just like a tremendous source of variability that we could use to understand like why these things evolve and how they're uh, orchestrated at a developmental level by say sex hormones and that sort of thing. Um, so that's really what, what got me into it. And then, you know, of course, lots of fascinating questions about, you know, ancestral mating competition and why this trait, why that trait, you know, why do males grow so much hair on their faces or, um, you know, uh, what, what about female body fat distribution? That's weird. N give me one other primate where females, you know, put their right, right, you know, fat on their breasts and, and hips, and <laughs> products like that. It's just, it's you know, um, anyway, interesting things like that that um, that I got into. But it was really, yeah, it was from 
initially just an interest in sort of understanding like our evolution and how and why we are the way we are and maybe especially behavior. And Brilliant. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I think, you know, anthropology and understanding the vast history of these things uh, is such a great way to go. And evolution in general, I think, gives you a good kind of grounding of understanding, you know, who we are, why we are the way we are. And instead of, you know, looking at things just from present day, you can kind of get amnesia uh, in that yeah. sense. So I think it's important to get, you know, the the background. So brilliant. What, uh, you know, takeaways would you want people to leave with, you know, reading your research? What's kind of your hope for people to to get? What kind of message? Ooh, well, that's a great question. You're, <laughs> I'm really on the spot now <laughs> because, um, like I said, most of my uh, motivation, and I think the motivation of this of the my students too, like my graduate students and so on, I think it tends to be sort of nerdy interest in sort of how we got to be the way we are. And I'll admit I'm I'm, you know, not often trying to cure cancer. Um, I'm mostly you know just thinking about. I think other people like to know why we have the traits that we do and understand ourselves. I mean, you you know we're we're our own favorite subject, right? We, we like to know like wh why we got that way. But some of the work we're doing, I think for sure, will have um, actual real world medical implications like studying how we study a condition, um, several different endocrine conditions, but one of them where um, people's, um, the brain, the, the hypothalamus doesn't tell the pituitary gland to tell the gonads to produce sex hormones. And so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, um, they have sort of normal sex hormone exposure um, in the first trimester um, for various metabolic reasons that I, I won't go into now. But after that, they produce very low sex hormones until they don't go through puberty and then they get on hormone replacement therapy. And so we can look at that people with that condition and say, well, how did that affect the brain? How did that affect behavior and psychology? Um, if you look like a male and are raised as a male, but you had very low sex hormone exposure all the way up until you got on hormone replacement therapy, or you look like a female raised as a female, but had low you know, estrogen production, um, and that can have all kinds of medical relevance to not just understanding um, sex differences, but but variation in sex. Like, well, how do you treat that people with that condition, or what are the effects of taking hormones for, like, say, transgender people? What what effect that might that have on psychology and behavior? And does it matter when you start treatment and so on? Um, so those are some some sort of real world practical uh, applications of the research that we do, um, but. As far as a big picture message, I guess maybe I'd go back to just saying that you know we're all we're all from Earth, and um, <laughs> you know um, that there are there are some sex differences that are probably you know not just a result of socialization and have a long evolutionary history in our species, um, and it's important to try to understand those and interesting to try to understand them, um, but you know we should still treat each other um, you know with respect and and uh, you know. E equally. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when undergrads ask me, you know, for advice, like, wh what should they research? Where should they go? I kind of tell them always to follow their nose. You know, if you follow your passion, you follow your interests, good things will happen. So I think you're a great example of that in terms of, you know, the nerdy interests that you discussed. Uh, I think that when you follow, uh, you know, your passion and what you're interested in, um, discoveries happen. So thank you, David. This has been really awesome. Thank you. Really fascinating. Yeah, it was really fun. My pleasure. <laughs>